Important time uh, in the state of Illinois. It's the time of transition. Uh, I will be presiding over the new General Assembly's uh, seating tomorrow uh, in the Senate. And uh, immediately after that, we will be uh, presenting the new General Assembly with our report on our term in office as uh, required by our state constitution. Uh, this report has not been done, I don't believe, for the last 20 years, so I think we can reestablish a good tradition. I think it's an important thing to do. Uh, the report uh, will highlight the key initiatives and priorities of our administration, uh, focusing on accomplishments, uh, as well as things that we worked on but didn't get done, and then we'll include recommendations uh, for the General Assembly to pursue in the coming months and coming years, uh, so we can continue the effort at improving the future for uh, the people of Illinois. Um, we will also include with this report copies of um, the executive summary and the uh, supporting materials from Lieutenant Governor Sanguinetti's task force on local government consolidation and unfunded mandates. Uh, her recommendations have partially been implemented, a small a portion of them have, but if we fully implemented her recommendations, we could save Illinois taxpayers about three and a half billion per year, and we think those recommendations should be pursued. Uh, we will also include another copy. I've given it to the General Assembly four years ago, but uh, for the record and for future discussion, we are gonna include the summaries of our uh, reform plans that we first introduced in the spring of 2015. Um, so we can uh, revisit some of those. Again, a portion of those have been implemented, but a significant portion of those have not. And they as well would result in uh, billions of dollars of taxpayer savings. And most importantly, they would help generate significantly faster economic growth for the state of Illinois, which has really got to be our uh, top priority. Uh, we had great successes over the last four years. It's been an honor, a deep privilege for Lieutenant Governor and I to serve the people of Illinois. We deeply appreciate that opportunity. We've also had some frustrations um, and some uh, goals that were not met, but that's a process. And we look forward to continuing to work, uh, both of us as citizens of the state of Illinois, to continue to try to create a better future uh, for all of our people, for all of our families. Uh, our greatest progress has been in education. We're deeply proud of that. That's one of the primary reasons I ran for governor, to try to uh, take steps to give us the best education system in the world. And we made great strides. Um, funding, equity, school choice, um, apprenticeship programs, great, great progress. Very proud of that. Uh, but there's a lot more to be done. Um, we need to do uh, what we did for K-12 uh, education for higher education in the state of Illinois, and I hope the legislators who have been working with our administration on that will continue to pr push that, and the new administration uh, brings to a successful conclusion uh, the improvements to our higher education system that are sorely needed. We've also made progress on economic growth, but much work needs to be done. We've cut red tape and regulations, lowered LLC fees, created Intersect Illinois, grown hundreds of thousands of jobs. But frankly, we continue to be a laggard compared to other states. Um, we could be, should be, one of the top fastest growing states in, the United, in, in, in America. Um, we are not. We continue not to be, and we haven't been for decades. That's probably our biggest challenge. We have got to make Illinois more competitive, and our recommendations really focus on that in this report and in the memo that I think you have just been given here uh, this morning, or this afternoon. Um, uh, great progress in education, great progress in uh, uh, many sectors of uh, government. Um, and uh, frustrations on the political and ethics side, we did some executive orders, but our executive order blocking uh, legislators from doing property tax appeals work just got thrown out by uh, JCAR. And uh, our efforts, our leadership on term limits, fair maps, and eliminating the conflicts of interest inherent in property tax work by legislators have all been blocked so far. I hope and am strongly encouraging members of the General Assembly to stand up to the leaders in their caucus and pass legislation to support term limits, fair maps, and elimination of property tax appeals work by legislators. This is critically important ethical reform, good government reform, and we recommend that in the most strongest terms. Um, it's been an honor for me to have Lieutenant Governor Evelyn Sanguinetti as my partner. 
She has led tremendous work inside the state government, streamlining and uh, making government more efficient and effective for taxpayers. She's led the efforts in our health care um, work, especially on the opioid crisis and ameliorating that tragedy for the people of Illinois. She's also been a great leader in education, and I'd like to invite Lieutenant Governor to make a few comments to you uh, right now. Thank you, Governor. Hello, everyone. Sorry. Never passed the 411 threshold. Thank you, Governor. Hello, everyone. Just wanted to end up by telling all of you what a wonderful time I have had being your lieutenant governor these past four years. I could say I've been to every nook and cranny in this state, went through all 102 counties to find out what made communities tick, what was holding them back. And I was able to move the needle because of all of you. You all sat down and gave me a piece of your mind. And I thank you all for that. I remember in my travels, consoling those parents who lost their children and loved ones to the opioid epidemic. And I could say today that we still have a lot of work left to do, but what we do have here in Illinois today is a 1-800 number that anyone could call 24 hours a day, seven days a week to ask questions. And that's 1-833 to find help. 1-833 to find help. And it is through our opioid plan that we also in initiated that standing order on Narcan. As all of you know, Narcan is that resuscitator. Those experiencing an overdose could take Narcan and come back to life. And a lot of people are taking Narcan and doing wonderful things with their lives after recovery. We have that because of our opioid overdose prevention plan. We also have a prescription monitoring program that is now required, and we're really making a dent. And we're hopeful that the next administration will continue in that vein so that we could make this epidemic a thing of our past. Now, it's no secret I joined forces with Bruce Rauner four years ago because of the education piece. And I am most proud of that piece. All of you know that English was not my first language. My parents were immigrants and refugees, and I felt my schools were underserved. So imagine, after having failed the first grade, I thought no opportunities would be given me. When I found that opportunity, I was able to excel. Joining forces with Bruce Rauner later in life allowed me to give those opportunities to children in all 102 counties, that equitably-based funding formula to help all of our children. And that's what I am most proud of. So in closing, I'd like to let the incoming administration know that we are rooting for you every step of the way. J.B. Pritzker, Juliana Stratton, congratulations. We're here to assist because your success is our success. We're all Illinoisans here. And I'd like to also close by saying God bless these United States, God bless all of you, and God bless the great state of Illinois. Thank you. Okay. Uh, questions for the Governor, you talked about higher education is a big piece of unfinished business, and I think some folks at, say, Western and Eastern and maybe all the way up to the U of I might say, well, Bruce Rauner was no friend of higher education. He uh, kept a lot of money promised during the budget impasse, et cetera. I mean, how, how do you square that with uh, uh, your saying that you really tried to help? Uh, I am a very strong advocate for all education, cradle to career. Uh, I am a very strong supporter of our higher education system. I've been a, personally a donor to it prior to uh, my becoming governor. Uh, it is unfortunate that our higher education system suffered under the budget impasse, uh, but we have an opportunity to correct um, our funding system for higher education and improve it. We have an opportunity to help our um, universities lower their costs with pension reform and procurement uh, reform and 
mandate relief. Um, we have an opportunity to create an environment where philanthropists will be more comfortable stepping up and funding our universities, as is done in many other states. Um, and we have an opportunity to rationalize our university system, focusing on centers of excellence so that we can have the best higher education system in the world. Uh, I will continue as a private citizen to work on these issues and advocate for them in the future. And I look forward to making progress. Yeah, I, uh, I say don't be upset at all. It's all a function of me being all in to win for the team for reform. This has never been about me. This, this job is not something that I've particularly sought in and of itself. All I care is that we save our state for our children and our grandchildren. And that's all I've ever worked on. And I have been totally devoted to that. Me and, and my personal situation is irrelevant. All that matters is that the team win and that we get major reforms done. And that's what I've been 100% committed to uh, every day. You said, you said you're going to revisit, I, I believe you said you're going to revisit in, in your message the, the things you came into office, the turnaround agenda mm -hmm. ideas. It, it, forgive the indelicacy here, but those things have been repudiated. And in, <laughs> fact, got, in fact, Speaker Madigan on the floor said it was an epic struggle today to defeat them. Nothing that you have said preached for four years has resonated with the people. Why, why do you still uh, persist in, in, in uh, pr pushing them? Change is hard. Change takes time. Um, and the folks that created the massive problems in our state certainly are resistive to change. That's, that's understandable. That doesn't mean that our recommendations are somehow wrong or flawed or, or incorrect at all. That means it's going to take time uh, to communicate with the voters and, and get the changes done. Uh, some of our elected officials will fight tooth and nail, av as they have, against term limits, fair maps, getting property tax work out of the, the legislators' hands. Um, uh, more than 60 percent of Illinois voters support um, Unionism, that's by choice, not by forced requirement. That's, that's a topic that, you know, the elected officials fight tooth and nail and continue to do. If you look at our series of recommendations, virtually everything that we've recommended is supported by a significant majority of the people of Illinois. Maybe not by some of the elected officials or the heads of the special interest groups that have an economic agenda in those items, but by the people themselves they're supported, and those changes would unleash the potential for the Illinois economy and result in dramatically higher economic growth, lower taxes, higher family incomes, and a better education system. What are your thoughts on the language? What are your thoughts on the language? We'll come back. We'll come back. What are your thoughts on those pay raises for directors? I hope this isn't the tip of the iceberg on new spending proposals. Um, I will say two things. First, I do believe that we underpay directors um, for the role they do. I believe that's true. I addressed that or tried to address it day one and have pointed this problem out for years by creating a foundation with don where donors could contribute so taxpayers didn't have to pay more. That was rejected by the powers that be in the General Assembly. Um, it's unfortunate because I think other states have done variations of that and I think that could help alleviate the problem. Um, but let me also say that we have uh, the highest paid government employees in America, in Illinois, not at the director level, but up and down the, the levels of the bureaucracy. And unless we're willing to take that on, um, going to um, the, the taxpayers of Illinois and say, let's spend more on our government bureaucracy would be fundamentally wrong and send absolutely the wrong message. What role, what role will you play in public life after this? Donations or involved in organizations or making speeches or running for something? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, let me, uh, the answer is not clear at this point. This is all being 
uh, sorted out. My priority for the coming months is to spend time with my family and friends who I haven't seen much of for six years. Uh, but then I will get back into um, uh, private life. I will uh, go to what I'm very passionate about, and that is building businesses, backing entrepreneurs. I've done that for th more than 30 years, building companies, starting companies, using technology to build businesses. I've been very blessed, been very successful at that, and I want to go back and do that some more. I want to go back to uh, philanthropy in a major way. I've sort of had to step away from that. This was my philanthropy, philanthropy for six years, and now I'm going to go back to more traditional philanthropy. Um, I've told my six kids that when I die, I ain't, I ain't taking it with me, and I'm not going to give it all to them. And so we're going to donate to schools, higher ed, the issues here in Illinois and around the country. I'm passionate on education, passionate on environmental protection. That's what got me into the whole government world when I was in high school originally. Uh, passionate on health care issues, especially women's health. And I will be very active in philanthropy in that. And then in terms of government or to politics, that's to be determined. I think there are a lot of things that are going to be up in the air and evolving here in Illinois and around the country. We live in such volatile times. I, I can't predict yet what would make sense. So, 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 let me just let me come back. Go ahead. You didn't make any mention of something that uh, previously you had listed as one of your big successes. I wonder where you would rank the outcome in the case of Janice. Oh, yeah. No, that's well, you'll see in the report. I would rank that very, very high on our list of accomplishments. Um, restoring free speech. Um, in organizations, in governments, state and local, and in schools, um, and removing forced unionism, forced um, union dues collections is a massive game changer. It won't happen. The changes won't have implications in the first few months, but in the coming years, major change in the balance of power between taxpayers and groups inside government. I also think we should take it to another level. Um, and certain things inside government should be removed from collective bargaining. Other states have done that. Democrats did it in Massachusetts. See, there's a real huge difference between a government union and a trade union in the private sector. The, 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 the conflicts of interest um, inherent in the government side are overwhelming. It's the reason Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president, who was a very strong union advocate, was against uh, government unions, it's, it's the, it's, there's a real difference, and we need to realize that difference and begin to address the balance of power in order to have a better future. The states that have taken on this issue of unlimited government union power have largely fixed their financial problems, and the states that have not have massive financial problems, like Illinois, like New Jersey, like Connecticut, like New York. They, they, this is where the problems lie. If I follow up. Let, me, let me go around again. Who, who hadn't got a first question yet? I, I don't think I should comment on that yet. I don't think that's appropriate. I think this is a big team decision. It's not mine or any one individual's. I hope that strong leaders will step up. There are a lot of issues to sort out within the Republican Party. I, my most fervent uh, hope is that the Republican Party uh, be a big tent, as Ronald Reagan advised, um, not be so uh, restrictive as to throw people out of the party or call them not Republicans. Um, and have a small party. Um, I also hope that the Republican Party will remember Ronald Reagan's great advice that someone who agrees with me 80 percent of the time is my friend and my ally, not my 20 percent enemy. I think the Republicans need to think about those issues, um, and I hope that good-hearted, um, reform-minded leaders will step up, and I certainly will encourage them and see if I can help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, Governor Lex Pritzker. What do you think of that, keeping in mind that you yourself signed bills at the very beginning of your term that were sent from the 98th General Assembly and not to Pat Quinn? Yeah, I don't think uh, that particular timing of that matters per se. There's a new administration. There is now a very dominant, powerful supermajority, um, very much p uh, policy aligned with the new incoming governor's administration. It is what it is, and we will all see the consequences of that in the coming weeks and months. Governor, do you still have that outstanding 
So everybody, just first questions, and now I want to go down and do another round. Any other first question? Everybody got? Okay, so we'll do a second round. Uh-huh. Is your administration going to request the Supreme Court to jump in and determine whether or not there's impacts from 2015? Well, we don't, uh, you know, we have a week. We're not, you know, but it's. Does that mean that the fight should, should just, you know, go out? We'll see. Well, well, I hope you follow that battle and ask the question of that to the new administration in the spring and summer. That'll tell you a lot about where things are going to go for taxpayers in the state of Illinois. Um, huge. It's, that's working through the, the, the court system right now, and, and uh, we'll see whether the lawsuits continue to be pursued by uh, the new administration. Let me say one of the most important issues that we have, and we, we, we have encouraged uh, the new administration to continue to pursue this, is the illegal, basically forced unionization of managers in state government in Illinois. We have some of the most unionized uh, government departments in America. Um, we have many departments where virtually everybody, including all the managers of the department, are unionized in the same union as the rank and file who work for them. Um, we also have many departments where mid-level uh, employees and lower-level employees make as much or more than senior managerial employees. This was created by Blagojevich primarily, um, but it, it's, much of it is illegal. It was improperly done. And we have been, obviously, the union is fighting us on this because they want to maximize their membership, which is understandable. <laughs> but but, but to, this is important, just to let me finish the point. This, this is a long-term transformation of state government. We can't run departments effectively without real managers whose incentives and priorities are the taxpayers, not the union, <coughs> not this, the state employees. That, that has to change, and that's a battle. That's through the courts and through heavy negotiation, and we hope that that effort, we've, we've made progress, but there's a long, long way to go, and we hope the new administration will continue to pursue that. Given your speech last summer that you would learn some lessons, you were a new governor, you are a better governor for the past couple years, notwithstanding weight loss or hair loss <laughs> that you've gone through. I'm gaining you know, it back, though. This was, holidays you, were good. If you, knowing what you know now, would you like to start over? Would you like to go back to January 2015 and do it differently? Oh. That's such a long topic. I'll go have a beer with you one of these nights and we'll talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Uh, in the beginning of your term, you would often tell a story about um, going into a government agency and you said that they had no computers. And yeah. if Bernie asked you repeatedly what the government agency was, you wouldn't tell them who you were about. <laughs> That's a fair question. Um, uh, there, are, there were several. Um, there be, they've been pretty much all digitized at this point. I don't want to embarrass some prior folks, it's just not helpful. We, we were one of the worst states for digitizing uh, government services in America when we came in. It was appalling. That causes inefficiency. That, that causes management um, inability to drive results but you, because you can't manage well what you don't measure. And, and we have made Illinois a national leader. The National Governors Association actually has come to Illinois to study what we've done and used what we've done to inspire other states to transform themselves from a digital point of view. And we've made progress, but there's a long way to go. But we've made great progress. President Governor, Trump? can I get yes. your thoughts on all the What What do you think about that? What he has been doing for more than 30 years is appalling. Um, it's outrageous. It's at the core of the type of corruption that's been eating away um, in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. Unfortunately, there are others, uh, other elected officials, who do exactly the same type of thing using their political position and political power to exert pressure on businesses and property owners to enrich themselves. This is not a one-person thing. Uh, I'm ecstatic that they finally indicted him. Um, long overdue, as I said last time, I think I was with you guys in this room. Um, there are others that do the same and worse. They haven't been indicted yet. I hope they are. I'll leave it at that. Um, and what, what's frustrating to me, I've lived, I was born in Chicago. I've lived around here most of my life. 
This behavior is relatively common knowledge in the business community in Chicago. This is not like some, oh, I'm shocked, I'm shocked. And businesses have left because of it. Businesses have um, not grown because of it. Um, and a lot of the business community has remained silent out of fear of retribution. And it's wrong. It is fundamentally wrong. I'm glad they finally got them. And I hope they get some of the others who are doing it. And some of the most powerful people in the state. On the executive order that would address legislators doing it, yep. should there be, and there is legislation to do that, it's not rules committee. <laughs> That's um, where the bills die, by the way. Right. Um, so should that be expanded, that idea be expanded yes. to include all elected officials who may deal with the problem? Yes. Of yes. And I've recommended that. I, I did an executive order so we could at least stop it at the state level for state tax portable bills. And oh, goodness, some legislators on JCAR said, oh, no. Can't do that with executive order. I'm shocked. Governor Reiner, uh, some other Illinois public, Republicans who have been around a long time and seen governors win, they've seen some lose, uh, guys like Craig Bates, uh, Rodney Davis, even, they, they, their analysis was that your combative posture with organized labor was antagonistic. And they said that you poking them in the eye early in your uh, candidacy, or in your term, may have led to your demise. I wonder uh, if, if you have any regrets in poking organized labor in the eye. So um, there are a lot of misperceptions of what I've said and done. Um, and let me be crystal clear. I want as many union jobs in the state of Illinois as we can get. I'm all in. My grandfather was a proud union member, and I'm all in. And I've got a lot of union member support. Question is, how do we do that? We've been bleeding out union jobs in Illinois for decades. We've been bleeding out high paying jobs for decades. Some people say, well, we got to just keep the status quo and try to force more unionism and try to unionize more of our companies. Okay, well, we've been trying that and it ain't working and we're losing. And, and if you or others, I hope, I hope in the coming months, well, that's one of the reasons we wanted to make sure this report got out there. If we study what's happening in other states, Wisconsin, Michigan, other strong union states, They've changed their rules. They don't have forced unionism anymore, and they're growing their union jobs way faster now than Illinois because manufacturers are going there. You can't have a union job if you don't have a job, and there are thousands of companies in America and around the world that won't invest in a forced union location. And all I've said is, hey, guys, how about if we just pick a few high unemployment neighborhoods? or a few counties and let them choose their regulation on that topic and see what happens. Let's get on the list, at least then Illinois is on the list for companies that want to grow and in the auto sector and other manufacturing. I don't think that's a bad thing. Nobody should be scared by that. And in fact, I think what you'll find is in those locations over time, more manufacturing, higher pay, rising wages, and more union jobs as well. Oh, so, um, Dave, I'm glad you asked the question. This is a really important topic because there's a lot, of, again, so many misperceptions. This is one of the biggest. I did sign the education bill, <coughs> and I and our team worked tirelessly to get that bill done, and it was a great bill. What the majority in the General Assembly did is to say, we know this is a great bill. This is great all the way around, and, Governor, you're going to get a win from this, so we're going to make sure that the city of Chicago gets extra benefits at the expense of the rest of the state in this bill. And I said, no, get that piece out. No, no bailout for Chicago. Treat every community the same. And they said, we won't fund schools. Schools will not open unless that piece stays in the bill. We fought. The, the Republicans in the General Assembly said, Bruce, we gotta, we're going to have to cave on that one. And so we got a terrible thing. You, if you don't live in Chicago, you're paying hundreds of millions of dollars more to Chicago that they don't deserve on any fairness basis because there's a lot of poverty in Waukegan and in Rockford and in Danville and Decatur. Those kids, those parents didn't get that extra hundreds of millions of dollars. I fought it. We lost. You win some, lose some. But in the end, 
we, I left that in for two reasons. We got school choice and the tuition scholarship tax credit program through that fight that wasn't in the original bill. That was a major step forward for low-income parents. And uh, we learned, I, I asked the analysis to be done, the way the education funding formula works is that over the next three to four years, that, that benefit for Chicago will go away the way the new money gets allocated and it gradually reduces over time and four or five years from now, Chicago is treated like everybody else. In the scheme of life, that's, a, that's called a compromise and a trade. That's in your part of your brain. Uh, uh, far and away the best is the people I get to work with. The people in Illinois are fantastic. You know, when I, when I was asked to run for governor years ago, um, everybody said, Bruce, you're going to hate it. Rupper chicken dinners and, you know, dealing with the wonderful members of the media and, you know, the, all that stuff. And they said, it's a good nightmare. You're going to hate it. And I've loved, I've loved the people. I actually love most of you guys. And it's, it's, uh, it's working with the people has been phenomenal. I've really loved it. Most who uh, <laughs> so, so let me just finish the question. So, um, uh, the um, uh, least favorite part is um, seeing the consequence of not making the changes that the people of Illinois need. It's so frustrating. It's so hard. I've never had so many things that I know matter and put so much of my effort into it that matters. It breaks my heart when I go to see the school children in some of our... It breaks my heart when I see some of... It the correction system, and we've made progress, but we got a long way to go. And when so much of what we're fighting for has been blocked, and I see the unemployment rate in Englewood, and Austin, and Lawndale, and in Danville, and Decatur, oh, it just, I tell you, I've, I've, I've gone sleepless nights worrying about the well-being of 12.8 million people. It's, I've, I, I, you know, it's hard. Did, did you have some of Okay, I'll get to you in a second. How migration increased last year under your term? What's the cause of it? How do you reverse it? What's your message to the administration? Tax hike that we got put in over my veto, the, the budget fighting. The, we have been a national leader in out migration for what? Years? Decades? Um, I, I'm scared that it's going to get a lot worse. The exodus is going to accelerate. There's so much talk about raising taxes. Raise the income tax, raise the gas tax, raise the whatever. Oh, goodness, if you're, a, if you're a working family struggling to make ends meet and your company's not growing, they're not adding people, they're not raising your salary very fast, but things are booming in Tennessee or Georgia or Florida or Texas, say, hey, uh, your sp hey sp spouse, maybe we ought to head out. I'm, I'm very scared about this. This is a problem. The exodus could accelerate. And I th my, one of my strongest recommendations in the report you all have is stop the discussion about tax hikes. Don't go to tax hikes. Get the reforms. We don't have to cut. And this is where I have agreed with the Democrats. I'm a social services, human services guy. I've not wanted to cut human services. Cut the cost of the government bureaucracy and grow the economy faster. Billions and billions of dollars can be made available for more human services, more education funding. That's the answer. I hope they'll change. I haven't seen the evidence that they're, I mean, the new administration has campaigned on tax increases. I hope that they see the light and change, but, you know, we'll see. What, what, what happens if they don't? I mean, what, uh, what's the detriment to Illinois' tax base? Well, you've, you've seen the results. We've been suffering from this for decades. Ta deficits, tax hikes, debt, Overregulation of our businesses, and I've blocked so many bills that would have ca caused more bad regulations. And I'm worried that I'm not, if I'm not there blocking them, that boy, they're going to pass a whole lot of bad regulations. That'll push more employers out. And then you got that death spiral going. And then with the corruption, self dealing. And uh, it's, that's what's been hurting us. That's what we've fought against. Again, we've made progress, but we're encouraging the new administration to. Where should be the GNI's faction of the Republican Party go? I think you've kind of said this, but I asked the last time you were here about there's the Edgar saying yeah, yeah. moderate, I saying you've got to stick to party principles, social and fiscal. Yeah. Where are you? You said you'd say more. I'm yeah, well, thank, yeah, thank you. I was counting on you, Bernie, to remember that. Yeah. So um, let, let me, this is a really important issue. So um, I would say uh, that the former governor and the former representative are both right. They're both partly wrong. And unfortunately, I think they're both part of the problem. And what do I mean when I say that? Um, 
Republicans, given the people of Illinois, Republicans won't win unless we're moderate in many, on, in many ways and in many things. And I certainly consider myself a moderate on many things. Um, and if you look at my record and things I've advocated and the bills I've signed, I think most people would say I'm a moderate. That said, if you're going to be a moderate and uh, to win elections, but you're not going to be a reformer and fix the problems, what's the point of winning? And in Illinois, Republicans have won in the 80s and 90s, but then they did the same bad stuff that the Democrats did. Kick the can on pension payments, don't reform the system, raise taxes with no reforms, overregulate businesses. If you're going to moderate to win and then do the same thing as the guy, as the guy or gal that you were running against was doing, what's the point? And I think Representative Ives is correct that you got to have some principles and you got to be fiscally responsible slash conservative. I call it responsible, she would say conservative, but it's balanced budgets. And I, to me, I hope the Republican Party rallies around a unifying message of being pro-taxpayer and pro-job creator. That, I think that can be a unifying message and that should define the party. The other things we're going to have some vehement disagreements on, obviously some of my fellow party members disagree with me on some of my more moderate views. Uh, okay, but that doesn't mean that we can't all be Republicans and push for responsible things for taxpayers and for job creators. Um, but we've got to stop this doing the same, both parties doing the same thing. In a lot of ways, the Republican Party for decades was sort of a weak subsidiary of the Democratic Party. Raise taxes, push, kick the can on pensions, overregulate, give unaffordable deals to the government unions. What's the point of winning? Sir, we have time for one someone, more question. Someone who understands uh, digging in during a negotiation while state government grinds to a halt, I wonder if you can comment uh, from your perspective on what's happening in Washington right now with the government shutdown, what advice you might have for President Trump and holding out for this $5 billion in extra spending at the border? Yeah, I, um, I have a lot to say about that. Most of it I'm not going to say today. Uh, I will say this. Um, I've been asked about the president many times, and I will make a comment. I will say that I uh, support most of the president's policy goals um, very strongly, um, and I'm appalled by his personal behavior, just appalled. And how that plays out in the coming months and years is not clear to me. Um, I support the president's goal of ending illegal immigration. That's his goal. He's been clear about that from the earliest days. Um, but in terms of policy to actually get that done, I personally believe the right way to do that is to do comprehensive immigration reform, streamline, simplify, and promote legal immigration, make it much easier and more welcoming legally, but end illegal immigration. And I believe the best way, and I'm very strong about this, I believe the best way to do that is by E-Verify for all employers in America, in every state, along with tough and tougher penalties for employers who break the law and don't hire Americans. That's the way to end illegal immigration. And we combine that with streamlining and supporting legal immigration, I think we'll have a good, we'll have a better future for the people of Illinois, the uh, people of America. The There's the, every, every elected official has a strategy and, and I'm not gonna get into the mechanics of specific tactics. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, everybody. Appreciate it.